Let us do the first topic out of these three. The first topic is adenoid. My dear friend, as I told you, adenoid is a lymphoid tissue. It's a single midline mass. And it is more prominent in children. It disappears by 20 years of age. Adenoid is an ill-defined lymphoid tissue. Means it has no capsule, no crypts, and no definite named artery to split. Adenoid is a normal tissue in children. But adenoid hypertrophy is a disease of school age children. What is the cause of that? Recurrent upper respiratory infection. Now look at this picture. Now adenoids are completely blocking the coena, the posterior opening of nasal cavity. So patient of course cannot breathe through the nose. So this child will be having a very classical picture of history of mouth breathing. A mouth breathing child is a direct clue for adenoid hypertrophy question. The look of this baby is called adenoid face. What are the various features of adenoid face? Number one, open mouth. Number two, pinched nose. Nose is useless. Number three is high arched palate. Due to mouth breathing, the palate goes high. And number four is crowding of upper teeth or malocclusion of teeth. The upper and lower teeth cannot touch each other. Dentition is affected due to mouth breathing. This child of adenoid can also have additional features like, very importantly, again, glue ear is a possibility. Glue ear is mostly bilateral because adenoid is a midline mass. Most probably, when it enlarges, it's going to block both the used to openings. And that will lead to conductive hearing loss and learning difficulties in the school age child. This patient can have snoring and rarely there can be possibility of obstructive sleep apnea also. The patient can have failure to thrive. Means the mother says that my child is not gaining weight and height. Failure to thrive. And the voice of the baby is a dull voice, hyponasality of the voice. And that is called what? Rhinolalia clausa or rhinolalia aperta? Yes, it is rhinolalia clausa. Nose is closed from behind. Na? So, type of voice in adenoid hypertrophy is rhinolalia clausa. Now, investigation. We do the x ray soft tissue nasopharynx lateral view to see the size of adenoid. And the treatment of choice is surgery. The name of surgery is adenoidectomy. This is done under general anesthesia. After GA, you palpate the adenoids and you put the patient in rose position. What is rose position? It is actually extension of the neck on chest and extension of head on neck, full extension. And the same position is used for tonsillectomy also. Please do avoid overextension of neck. Overextension of neck can lead to accidental subluxation of C1, C2 vertebra. This atlantoaxial subluxation due to overextension of neck in adenoid tonsil surgery is called Grissel syndrome. You are the intern in the evening, posted in the ENT ward, surgery done by me in the morning. How would you suspect it? The chief complaint will be, mother will say, the child has neck pain or neck spasm after surgery. What is the investigation we will plan together? Of course, MRI neck. And urgent neurosurgery consultation is required. What are the various methods of surgeries for adenoid? Number one, conventional method. The old method is curettage. It is done with the help of St. Clair Thompson adenoid curette. And look at the surgery. You can see over there. It's a blind procedure. So there is high chance of complications and more bleeding also. Now let's talk about the new methods, latest methods, which are more safe. Number one is coblation. Look at this coblation wand. Coblation is the best method of adenoidectomy, is the question for exam. Number two is suction diathermy, the cautery. And number three is micro debrider. These three techniques, coblation, suction diathermy, and micro debrider, are 
endoscopic method of surgery where you visualize it so they are more safe there is less chance of complication and less bleeding also look at the coblation coblation is the best method you can see over here it's controlled ablation it is eating away the adenoid without significant bleeding even so it is the best method of the surgery my dear friends let us now learn one topic which has been maximally asked in pharynx is the angiofibroma the complete name is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma it is a most common benign tumor of nasopharynx what is site of origin it is sphenopalatine foramen now look at the name angiofibroma it's a highly vascular tumor it is made of blood vessels and it always has profuse epistaxis in the presentation now one very famous question is why angiofibroma bleeds so much the reason is the blood vessels which make this tumor do not have muscular layer so once cut they cannot contract or retract therefore they keep bleeding for a very long time therefore angiofibroma always has got a recurrent profuse epistaxis in the history given in the exam now angiofibroma is typically seen in young adolescent males in 12 to 18 years of age so it means that it's an androgen dependent tumor therefore pre operative flutamide which is anti androgen or pre operative estrogen will cause shrinkage of the tumor and make the surgery little easier any genetic association found to some extent yes which is the gene cmyc gene now angiofibroma is a benign but a locally invasive tumor so it originates from nasopharynx and then it grows into nose from nose into various paranasal sinuses number 2 it can go to the cheek area and you know the cheek area is technically called the infratemporal fossa region and to grow into the cheek is it has to grow behind the maxilla and the area behind the maxilla is called the pterygo palatine fossa so from nose to sinuses yes and from the nasopharynx area to behind the maxilla into pterygo palatine fossa from there to cheek region into infratemporal fossa the third one is it can grow into orbit also the orbital extension will lead to proptosis the eye protruding out and this is called frog face deformity my dear friends and there is definitely possibility of intracranial extension so what is the clinical profile of the patient in the exam it's generally a young adolescent male 12 to 18 years presenting with unilateral reddish pinkish red nasal mass with the recurrent profuse epistaxis so this triad is there a young boy some nasal mass and epistaxis think of angiofibroma as the first possibility there can be other features like cheek swelling the protrusion of the eyeball the patient might be having headache due to intracranial extension the patient will have dull voice which is called rhinolalia clausa there is a possibility of patient having the conductive hearing loss also due to glue ear now my dear friends let us think about the various staging systems we use to classify the you know grading of angiofibroma the two dominant ones are number one redkowski staging and number two fish staging redkowski is asked more commonly let's first of all do redkowski grading the redkowski staging is now stage 1 is what from nasopharynx it comes into the nose region or the sinus region so if nose is involved it is 1a and if sinus also involved any it's 1b now stage 2 is if tumor grows towards cheek area it can have three you know staging further sub staging 2a 
2b 2c now imagine the area behind the maxilla that area is called which which fossa terigo peridon fossa now if tumor minimally invades into terigo peridon fossa behind the maxilla it is stage 2a if tumor frankly occupies the terigo peridon fossa it is stage 2b and if tumor grows into infratemporal fossa region towards cheek area it is stage 2c finally the stage 3 is the intracranial extension so let us do the fish staging now if the tumor is limited to nasopharynx or nose area it is stage 1 if tumor grows into pterygoparin fossa or any of the sinuses it is stage 2 if the tumor grows into infratemporal fossa or the orbit it is stage 3 and the brain involvement with the dural involvement is stage 4 of fish staging Investigation. Number one, biopsy is contraindicated. It's a vascular tumor, very vascular tumor. Number two, contrast anion CT would show Hallman Miller sign or enteral sign. What is that? It is anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxilla. Bowing means push. The tumor pushes the posterior wall of maxilla forward. Look at this clinical picture again. The tumor is growing into pterygo pardon fossa and here it is pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forward. This is called the Hallman Miller sign. Let us see on the radiology picture now. This is the CCT. It's an axial cut. Look at the normal side, maxillary sinus. And look at the disease side. That red arrow depicts the tumor. And this red arrow is pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forwards and that is called the Hallman Miller sign or enteral sign. Number three, angiography. The angiography is done to find out the most common source of bleeding for angiofibroma. Any guesses which is the most common source of blood supply for this tumor? Is internal maxillary artery. Why? It is majorly growing behind the maxilla. Pre-operative embolization of this artery, maxillary artery, will reduce the blood loss during surgery. Any role of MRI? Yes. If CT scan shows the involvement of brain, we do the MRI also to rule out whether there is dural invasion or not. Treatment plan, of course, is surgery is the treatment of choice. What are the approaches to be kept in mind? For early Limited angiofibromas to nose, nasopharynx, or sinus regions, we go for the endoscopic approach. So, the best approach for limited angiofibroma nowadays is endoscopic transnasal approach. And if that's not the choice, then what? Then we go for Wilson's transpalatal approach in the early limited angiofibromas. So, what about the advanced tumors, which are going to the cheek region also? We can do mid-facial degloving or we can do the lateral anatomy with medial maxillectomy approach. Any role of radiotherapy? If the tumor has shown intradural extension on MRI, then surgery would not be able to remove the tumor. In that case, radiotherapy is indicated. My dear friends, after discussing the benign tumor angiofibroma of nasopharynx, let us talk about the malignancy of nasopharynx called nasopharyngeal carcinoma, NPC. This cancer is more common in China. If the cancer is more common in China, it's a Chinese cancer. The etiology has to be a virus. Which virus is the culprit? Epstein-Barr virus. What is the age of the patient? It's an adult of 50 to 70 years. What is site of origin? This is answer is fossa of Rosenmuller. Look at the visual question. This is a eustachian tube opening. And right above that, when you can see an arrow over there, that arrow shows fossa of Rosenmuller. So an arrow just above the eustachian tube opening is fossa Rosenmuller. It is site of origin of nasophageal carcinoma. My dear friends, you can see over there. It is a hidden cancer. It is not visible from outside. It's called occult primary. It's 
easy to be missed cancer. That is therefore the most common presentation of NPC is metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy or secondary neck node. It's a very very important thing to, to be kept in mind. Primary cancer is hidden. So the presentation unfortunately will occur with the secondary neck node or metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy. Patient will come to my clinic and he will say, Dr. Dhawan, I've got neck masses over here. I'll ask for an FNSE. The FNSE shows metastatic squamosal carcinoma. And then retrospectively, I put an endoscope in the nose and I go behind the nose and nasopharyngeal area and I see a frank ulceroprolifidic growth over there. And then I take a biopsy from there. And it is now being proven as malignancy of the nasopharynx. It's pretty unfortunate. The second symptomatology is the glue ear. Why? This cancer is right above the using tube. It's going to block the ET opening in next couple of months. Patient develop unilateral glue ear and that lead to unilateral conductive hearing loss. My dear friends, keep in mind, adenoid also cause glue ear. But adenoid is a predominant problem in school age children. And adenoid disappear by 20 years of age. So adenoid causing glue ear in a school age child is a very known fact. But adult of 50, 70 year getting unilateral glue ear is a very suspicious entity. Please rule out the nasopharyngeal carcinoma first in this case. The third one, just imagine where is the nasopharyngeal roof, skull base, skull base. And if you look carefully, NPC is a skull base cancer and all the cranial nerves are coming out of skull base. So NPC will lead to cranial nerve paralysis also. And that lead to trotus triad. So trotus triad is seen in nasopharyngeal carcinoma NPC and the beauty is the mnemonic of this triad is also NPC N stand for neuralgia in temporoparietal area due to fifth nerve involvement P for palatal paralysis due to tenth nerve involvement and C for conductive hearing loss due to glue ear and all these features are unilateral and ipsilateral NPC is a radio sensitive cancer so the primary treatment modality in this cancer is chemo radiation, means radiotherapy along with chemotherapy. By chance, chemo radiation is not given a choice. Then you mark radiotherapy. 